It was one of the largest projects in the history of mankind, the Third Reich's bomb-proof factories. Germany's Wunderwaffen were to bring death and destruction to its enemies. Gigantic underground plants would have kept the supply chain running for the Wehrmacht. Armaments Minister Albert Speer had devised a monstrous plan for his Führer. Today, only few may set foot in the remnants of the mammoth project. Hundreds of millions of Reichsmarks were spent in order to hollow out entire mountains. Production plants for weapons essential to the war effort were to be built in underground tunnel systems. Hundreds of thousands of slave laborers had to toil for the ambitious plans of the Nazis. The number of those who lost their lives is uncertain. Up until the last day of the war, work in the tunnels went on feverishly. Yet how close had the Nazis come to accomplishing their outrageous project? What would have happened if the underground armament production had run successfully? Would Hitler's war of annihilation have claimed millions more victims? A slope close to the Bavarian town of Oberammergau. Here, one of the mysterious tunnel systems laid out by the Nazis is hidden from the eyes of the Inquisitive. The only entrance is blocked with a concrete seal. Only the state-appointed geologist may open it. Every few years, he has to make sure that everything inside is intact. Heinz Rabe is responsible for about 20 subterranean tunnel systems in southern and eastern Germany. He has to test whether the installations which were built 60 years ago are still safe. After the end of the war, the Americans went into the tunnels in Oberammergau and searched through everything. Since then, the tunnels have stood empty. The wooden lining is rotten and stones may come loose from the roof at any time. During the war, the plant belonged to Messerschmitt AG. It served as a bomb-proof production and development plant for the aircraft construction. According to the plans, there were three or four portals. We've opened one. The others were all blasted at the end of the war. Here we have two parallel tunnels of about 80 or 90 meters in length, connected by cross sections. They were used as bomb-proof production plants. The Allies knew of 340 underground construction sites even before the end of the war. Over 400 had been given code names during the Third Reich and the plans of the Ministry of Armaments pointed to some 800 plants. The Nazi leadership had hesitated for some time before it decreed the excavation of subterranean factories. Only in the summer of 1943, when the air raids of Allied bomber squadrons became increasingly destructive, did Hitler's armament minister, Albert Speer, give the command to systematically transfer the war production underground. Initially, the industry rejected the idea, although the outrageous costs were borne by the government. The plans appear to be incomplete and their implementation too chaotic. At first, the Nazis had existing mines expanded. One of the first projects was realized at the end of 1943 on the bank of the Neckar River. Codename Neustadt. 120 meters deep, under the vineyard slopes, a gigantic subterranean tunnel system still lies here, out of sight.
Initially, the mines in Neckart Simon had been extracting gypsum for over 150 years. During World War I, they housed a dynamite factory, and from 1937, they were used to store ammunition. Whether the workers' latrines date from World War II is uncertain, as this tunnel system is one of the few that are still in use. The Iron Gate opens into a subterranean town. The mountainside is hollowed out by a road network 34 kilometers long. A gigantic arms forge was to be built here on an area of 130,000 square meters. It was partly put into operation in the spring of 1944. Today, the facility covers a total area of 170,000 square meters. Some units of the German armed forces are stationed in Neckartzimmern. Two plants were transferred here during World War II. The production of ammunition casing of a nearby ammunition factory and a ball bearing production plant from a factory that was initially situated in Schweinfurt. When the army began to expand this installation in 1957, Europe was in the political crisis of the Cold War. Because of the threat of possible confrontation, facilities were sought that would also be nuclear bomb proof in order to be able to store high grade valuable parts and to continue the necessary repairs even under aggravated conditions of war. Seven hundred and twenty people work underground here, providing supplies and repair parts for the army. The maintenance of the plant costs the German Ministry of Defense 1.6 million euros annually. Our job these days in this underground facility is to repair and store for safekeeping sensitive materials, particularly materials which are worth being guarded. The greatest advantage here is that we have special climatic conditions, invariable air temperature and humidity, so that there is little effort involved in preserving and packaging. In addition, because of the few access points and ventilation shafts, the plant is also very easy to guard, so the number of guards necessary is comparably small for this gigantic installation. In the same tunnels where materials are stored for the German peace missions in Kosovo and Afghanistan today, weapons of war were to be produced 60 years ago. The expansion of the tunnel system would have cost at least 50 million Reichsmarks, only half of the project was completed by the end of the war. The ball bearing factories in Schweinfurt in particular were the target of the Allied bomber raids. In spite of heavy losses, the Americans succeeded in raising the factories to the ground. Their main goal, however, namely to paralyze the production of supplies for Hitler's Wehrmacht, was not achieved at that stage. Up to 80% of the key war industries were to be moved underground. Along with the ball bearing factories, these were the production plants for aircraft engines, fuel tanks, and the secret missile program of the SS. Only about 20% of these projects were put into operation. Installations that were considered essential for the war effort were well camouflaged in order to become invisible to the Allied reconnaissance planes. For instance, the gigantic fuel tanks of Nazi Germany were bunkered underground from as early as the mid-1930s. One such tank near Bremen is still in operation over 60 years later. The state-owned installations must be maintained regularly. Only trained personnel can descend into the tanks.
Each of the 80 gigantic tanks holds 4,000 cubic meters of fuel. They're made of 12 millimeter thick shipbuilding steel with a one meter thick concrete jacket. Everywhere in the Third Reich, the underground construction work was given the highest priority. Die Absicht der Feinde, durch planmäßigen und massierten Bombenwurf die deutsche Rüstung zu zerschlagen, ist gescheitert. Rechtzeitig und mit deutscher Gründlichkeit wurden kriegsentscheidende Fertigungen unter die Erde verlagert. This propaganda film is called Weapons, Hands, Hearts. It contains rare footage of the subterranean construction sites. These scenes were shot in Kala, in Thuringia, where an aircraft factory was to be built. Codename, Lax. It was mostly foreign slave laborers who had to do the dirty work in the tunnels, under inhuman conditions. On our first day, we were divided into groups. A German officer made his speech and told us, you will work until you drop dead. Three people had to drill holes in the tunnels, another three shoveled, and one took out the full tippers. We stood on a scaffold and drilled huge holes into the roof, 2.5 to 3 meters deep, which were filled with dynamite. Then they blasted it, and we had to get back to work and start shoveling immediately afterwards. We could not even see one another in all the dust and gases, but they were merciless. We had to carry on. After their grueling 12-hour shift, the tens of thousands of slave laborers were given a frugal food ration. At the beginning of February 1945, even 14 to 16-year-olds were assigned to Kala in order to help with the construction. From a technical viewpoint, the concept was rationally thought out and essential, considering the air supremacy of the Allies over Germany. But the means to realize it were sheer madness, of course. The engine had to be kept running at full steam, although it was foreseeably speeding towards disaster, namely the end of the Thousand Year Reich. And the cruelties that took place was something that is beyond the understanding of a normal thinking and feeling human being. Die deutsche Führung verkündete, der deutsche Himmel muss und wird wieder freigekämpft werden. Unsere Erfinder und Konstrukteure werden der Masse der feindlichen Terrorbomber Flugzeuge entgegenwerfen, die in Abwehr und Angriff unbedingt siegen werden. One of the most closely guarded new weapons of the Luftwaffe was manufactured in Kala, the jet fighter ME-262. The first aircraft was ready for takeoff in mid-February 1945. The jet fighter looked like a fish. It was ultra-modern, very slim and presumably very fast. We'd heard some rumors that the plan was to build 1,200 fighters here every month. We just couldn't believe that. But it happened before our eyes. We were all terrified because it was obvious that if the war lasted any longer, we would not survive. These aerial photos of Kala were taken by the US Air Force in 1945. The bunkered entrances and the freight lift at the side of the mountain are clearly discernible. Inside the mountain, the Nazis planned to build a total of 30 kilometers of passageways. At the end of the war, almost half this distance had been blasted through the rock. The tunnels that were not lined led into the actual heart of the plant, four gigantic subterranean halls covering 27,000 square meters, where the manufacturing was to take place.
We are in one of the huge halls which they were planning to use for the assembly of the jet fighters, the Me-262. Here the fighter was put together and then transported above ground through this large cross-section of the tunnel. Then it was hoisted up the mountain by means of an elevator and from there it would take off. Above the totally excavated mountain ridge, the Germans had apparently laid out a runway for this purpose. The serial production of the jet planes was only a question of time. As it happened, only few of them ever took off from there. I remember two takeoffs of Me-262s. We were working outside and were able to see the sloping elevator as well as what was happening above ground. We all looked up and some were already pointing at the horizon and then we saw this strange aircraft flying incredibly fast. One could really say that the Me-262 was another wonder weapon. The Nazi leadership had placed great hopes on the potential of the new wonder weapon. Ultimately, however, even the state-of-the-art jet fighter was largely ineffective against the superiority of the Allied air combat forces. Up until the end of the war, hundreds of thousands of internees were transferred from the concentration camps in the east to the Reich in order to build new aircraft factories within a few months. Max Mannheimer came from Auschwitz to Mühldorf, a town by the Inn River, in February 1945. We knew that a subterranean factory was to be built there, and we also knew that the reason for that was because the armament plants above ground were all being bombed. They decided to transfer everything under the surface of the earth. Here, for example, there should have been three stories underground and three stories above. To me, it seemed like ancient Egypt and the building of the pyramids. A lot of people running back and forth, driven by overseers, because it was a project that had to be finished very quickly. A five-meter-thick and 400-meter-long roof made of reinforced concrete would form a vault over the production halls. Some 2,000 inmates lost their lives during its construction. The main jobs were digging, carrying iron and carrying cement. That was actually the worst command and also the most feared. The SS doctors at the time calculated that an inmate who did this job, and if he performed as he was expected to do, had a life expectancy of 60 to 80 days. And this calculation proved to be quite accurate. When the war ended, Max Mannheimer's body weight was 37 kilos. Many of his fellow laborers did not live to see the liberation. Crammed in freight trains, they were evacuated from Muldorf and other camps and taken to Dachau. The pictures of the dead, but also those of the survivors, shocked the free world. In a forest northeast of Nuremberg, there is another hidden portal to a tunnel, usually sealed by a concrete wall. Mining engineers have opened it in order to carry out some maintenance work. The Doggerwerk near Hersbruck is one of the biggest subterranean constructions built by the Nazis. Even today, the people in the surrounding villages in the Franconian Alb do not know how large the mysterious tunnel system in the mountain really is. The tunnels were lined in parts, but evidently never used. Once a year, Heinz Raber inspects the installation. Especially during the winter, tunnel parts cave in and must be repaired, a job which requires a lot of effort. 
The mining expert is well aware of how dangerous working underground is, particularly in the sections that had not been reinforced by the Nazis. Loosened blocks of stone can fall at any time. We're now leaving the lined tunnel sections and entering the unlined ones. As you can see here, it's all sandstone without support, and the greatest risk is that piles of sandstone come loose from the roof and fall and cause depressions that can reach as far as and be seen from above ground. The Nazis gave this installation the code name Isha 1. We're now coming into a heading to the point where this tunnel should have been driven forward. You can see here that the boreholes were blasting. These black dots had already been made. And if you're lucky, you can also find explosive cartridges in the boreholes next to the drill rods, like this one here, which is an original, that are still embedded in the stone. Here is one such cartridge. So the boreholes were loaded, ready to be blasted. It all stopped abruptly. They left everything behind, just as it was. Over 9,000 inmates from the Flossenburg concentration camp were forced to work here under appalling conditions, so that the tunnels were excavated as quickly as possible. Some 3,500 of them died. From the planned 100,000 square meters of area, only about 15,000 were completed. The excavations should have been continued in this direction, as you can see from these so-called drifts. These galleries are all 20 meters apart from one another and would have been used as production plants. The excavation works on this tunnel system began in March 1944 and continued up until May 1945. Approximately 7.5 kilometers of tunnels were dug. Parts of them, about 10 percent, had already been lined with concrete, while the rest is still unsupported. This underground installation was to be used for the production of BMW aircraft engines. And the aim was to transfer the manufacturing plant from above ground to a bomb-proof underground site. The slave laborers blasted and removed half a million cubic meters of Dogger sandstone from the mountainside. Yet aircraft engines were never built here. By order of the American occupying power, the portals to the tunnel system were walled up after the war, and the abandoned plant fell into oblivion. Every now and again, former concentration camp inmates come here in order to commemorate their murdered companions. There was one new type of weapon on which the Nazi leadership pinned their hopes that would bring a decisive turn in the course of the war. In the propaganda jargon of the Third Reich, it was called V2. V stood for vengeance. Missile engineer Wernher von Braun had developed in Peenemunde a new ballistic missile of the type A4 to a stage where it was ready for production. With the V2, the Nazis wanted to bomb targets in England and thus terrorize the British civilian population. Despite numerous unsuccessful launch attempts, the V2 was operational in the summer of 1944. 